let us now begin our panel discussion. Moderating this session will be Mr. Ong Zi Yang, Portfolio Manager, FSM1 Singapore. On the panel, we have Darshan Puri, Director and Lead Product Strategist, European Equities, BlackRock Fundamental Equities. And Ms. Erica Lau, Portfolio Manager, Lion Global Investor, no, Lion Global Singapore Trust Fund, Lion Global Investors. Over to you, Zia. All right, thank you, Geraldine. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second and last panel discussion of the day. Welcome, uh, Erica and mm -hmm. Dashan. Very happy to have you guys here uh, in the panel with us today. Uh, the main objective of this panel really is to discuss some of the hottest topics that are up there at the top of investors' mind. Topics that our audience would definitely love to hear both your thoughts on. The topics that we are about to discuss today uh, revolve around three main themes. First, we'll start with your respective views on inflation and uh, what kind of timeline can we as investors kind of expect to see in terms of uh, tapering of the very accommodative policy put out by global central banks ahead. From there, we'll lead into the respective uh, capital market outlook for Singapore, which I will direct to Erica, and Europe, which I will direct to Dashan. And uh, last but not least, we'll round off with the main question in the title of the segment, why building uh, a global diversified portfolio is important when investing in the rest of 2021 and beyond, and how should our investors go about doing so? With that, uh, with We'll, without much further ado, I'll start the ball rolling with uh, Erica on the first topic, which is your views on inflation and central bank tapering. So Erica, yesterday we saw a US inflation rate holding steady at a 13-year high, right? a 5.4% on year-on-year basis, which is the third consecutive month that we have seen uh, inflation hitting past the 5% threshold. In Europe, we saw inflation picking up to 2.2% in July, which breaking past the ECB target of about 2%. So what's your thoughts on this and uh, what's your outlook on inflation ahead? Okay. Um, the, uh, while the inflation has been elevated, the uh, pandemic-related sectors that have contributed to the bulk of the month-on-month -month increase in inflation has been rolling off. So as such, we feel that um, inflationary pressure is temporary and that uh, inflation would taper off as uh, production bottlenecks uh, ease and also as the recovery tr transitions from goods to services. Mm. All right. So how do you think that uh, global central banks will react ahead? Will they continue to be very accommodative? Uh, yeah. What's your reaction to this inflation? Under the scenario that uh, I have, I think that you know, central bankers would not be forced to do preemptive rate hikes mm. and it, uh, monetary policies will remain accommodative yeah, in the near term. In the near term. Okay, same, so same question to you, Dashan. Uh, so what's your thoughts on this? Do you agree with the transitory inflation uh, theory uh, that uh, Erica uh, is sticking to? Or do you think that inflation is likely to be a bit stickier or expected to be a bit longer than ex uh, expected? So what's your outlook on inflation? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question and good evening. Um, I, th I think our views are pretty well aligned with the comments that uh, Eric has made. Um, I, I should caveat my, my comments by mentioning that I represent a fundamental equity team. So our views on inflation are very much built from the bottom up through speaking to companies rather than through looking at uh, kind of high level macro data. But through, um, th through all those conversations that we're having with companies and through the data that we're looking at from individual companies, it's very clear to us that this bout of inflation is transitory as well. Uh, it's being driven by uh, factors like used car prices, for example, which are up double digits. Uh, it's being driven by things like elevated um, uh, kind of airfares, uh, elevated freight rates, uh, and also supply disruption, which, which Erica mentioned as well. Now, partly that supply disruption is a result of uh, inventory destocking that we saw last year. Um, it's partly a result of um, disruption in the shipping markets. One stat we saw recently just giving evidence to that. The latest point is that only about 50% of uh, MESC um, container ships are actually arriving at their destinations on time. So kind of summing that up, you know, all, all of the data that we're looking at, all the conversations we're having with company management teams are pointing us to, uh, to the answer that inflation is, is transitory. All right. Thank you, Dashan. 
I think that's a very insightful answer, I think, on our base case scenario. Uh, on terms of house view, uh, we're actually quite similar to uh, Erica and Darshan. We think that uh, it will be quite uh, transitory. But of course, we did uh, have a, bit, a little bit of a hawkish case where inflation could be, the kind of tapering expectations could be a little bit earlier than expected. Uh, so I think from there, uh, I think we kind of established the kind of picture that to expect a hit for the macro situation. So I'll move on to the second theme, which is uh, the outlook for Singapore and uh, Europe, respectively. So uh, do you, Erica, Singapore has had quite a middling performance uh, so far, uh, definitely behind our U, uh, US and Europe equities, but definitely better than our Asian peers. So in this environment ahead, uh, what is your outlook for Singapore equities? Right. Um, as you all know, the vaccination rate for Singapore is uh, at 70% now, and we are aiming for 80% uh, by September. So with such a uh, high vaccination rate, I expect um, the domestic economy to start to reopen, and therefore, um, and ultimately, you know, the borders to reopen as well as, you know, globally, the race for vaccination continues. So um, on a 12 to 18 months uh, time frame, uh, I remain positive on Singapore equities. Um, and we think that you know, valuation remains very uh, undemanding. So we are trading at about 35% discount to the Asian peers. Um, you have uh, reopening optimism, which you know, uh, can come anytime because you know, we are in a process of reopening now. And then three, uh, we also have um, the uh, restructuring of corporate uh, recently, which you know, uh, should generate higher returns going forward as these companies, they um, consolidate resources and actually invest in higher growth areas. Uh, and finally, um, I think that um, the, uh, uh, the companies that we have met uh, uh, and, and, and invested in, they all have shared a very strong um, growth outlook. And, and I think that, you know, that provides the basis for our a positive outlook on Singapore markets. Mm, all right, thank you, Erica. Yeah, I think uh, I saw the Bloomberg article as well. Where it's quite uh, strange how quickly we became uh, the most vaccinated country uh, around the world. And uh, that kind of opti uh, reopening optimism uh, is really quite, uh, quite real. So uh, what is your key strategies or uh, more specifically, what sectors and investment teams within Singapore are you most bullish on? Um, there are three themes that I'm pretty bullish on. Uh, the first is actually, uh, of course, recovery laggards. So while you know we are in a process of uh, reopening, given our high vaccination rates, right? I, I, I'm seeing a lot of um, recovery recovery plays that are still lagging. And one example is actually um, Comfort Delgro. So this is a direct beneficiary to the ultimate uh, domestic reopening, where activities normalize and where you know, the nation progresses into an endemic state. However, um, valuations are still compelling, uh, trading at um, below historical mean. And at the same time, we have uh, added catalysts of uh, real reforms, as well as uh, value unlocking from, um, from, selling off their, from listing their uh, Australian assets. Uh, secondly, uh, we are also seeing bright spots in the small cap, small, small cap space. Uh, if you look at the small cap index, FSTE, ST Catalyst Index, that is actually trading above pre-COVID levels and it is also tr uh, outperforming the STI index. So um, there are a few uh, uh, stocks that you know, we, we, we like uh, in that space. Uh, they, they all have a very strong uh, earnings outlook and yet uh, trading at attractive uh, valuations. So examples would be uh, QNM Dental as well as Hourglass. Mm -hmm. And the third uh, theme is actually restructuring. Uh, recently, we have actually seen an acceleration of uh, the uh, restructuring of companies, and that has actually boosted the sentiment of uh, Singapore stocks. But longer term, I think that uh, companies right, uh, would actually benefit because they can consolidate their resources and um, uh, look for uh, higher growth areas to expand into, and that should generate higher returns. Um, it is encouraging to see that you know, a lot of Singapore companies are actually diversifying and transforming into uh, growth areas like smart nations, urbanization, as well as um, 
clean energy solutions and digitalization. And um, this bodes well for these companies uh, in the medium future. Um, uh, Semcorp Industries, a uh, renewables uh, proxy, is an example. They are aiming to increase their profit contribution of uh, clean energy solution from 40% to 70% by 2025. And we believe that you know, as they execute their green transformation strategy, uh, the, the stock will continue to re-rate. Mm. All right, thank you, Erica. Sounds like we, there's quite a lot of interesting themes. So we have the legged sector, the small cap, as well as some of the restructuring plays within Singapore itself. So it, it looks like there's a lot of very uh, value opportunity within Singapore. That's right. So now we will take the, the we will move to uh, Europe, uh, Dashan. So the same question to you, to you. Uh, Europe equities clearly has been one of the leaders uh, globally so far. Uh, he's de delivered really solid returns for investors in the first half. And so much so, so that the benchmark took 600 is now at a record high level. So do you think that this can be sustained for the rest of the year and or even beyond that? Yeah, that's right. And uh, I mean, I think the, the simple answer is yes, the performance has been very strong. And yes, I think it can be sustained. Um, the, the slightly more nuanced answer is that there is this kind of popular misconception that European equities is all about, um, you know, inflation and all about value. And I think some of the some of the drivers of the rally earlier in, in this year uh, has been driven by that. So some of the lower quality businesses in Europe, like um, some of the auto companies, for example, um, some of the energy companies, some of the mining companies, some of the steel makers, those sorts of kind of low quality, um, low margin businesses um, rallied very strongly uh, up until kind of March or April. Um, uh, but they're in this process of seeing this big cyclical upswing and they're on peak margins. Now, going forwards, um, the, the way to be positioned is um, looking at the higher quality businesses and looking at those sorts of businesses. We're really, really encouraged by what we've been seeing in uh, recent earnings reports from these companies. So just to give a couple of examples, um, one of our favorite um, healthcare companies is a contract drug manufacturer. Um, so it's a, it's a big beneficiary of the big pharma companies outsourcing the manufacturing of their drugs. Uh, this company has been beating on the top line. It's been beating on the bottom line. Uh, its customers are actually funding its capex, which is which is really remarkable. Um, and this is a business where we're expecting to see high teens EPS growth uh, for several years. So that's one where uh, you know we expect very strong performance to be sustained. In other parts of the market, we're seeing similar strength. Uh, one of our freight forwarding businesses. This is a company that moves goods around the world. Is seeing volumes up uh, something like 25% year on year uh, in its air freight business, up double digits as well in its sea freight business. It's taking market share, it's cutting costs. Uh, and again, it's beating estimates and raising guidance for the rest of the year. So that's another one where we would expect uh, very strong performance going forwards. And then finally, in a, in a totally different part of the market. So we've spoken about healthcare, we've spoken about freight forwarders, totally different part of the market, luxury goods where Europe has a phenomenal heritage uh, in this area. We're seeing, again, one of our favorite luxury goods companies uh, just reported revenues up 84% year on year. Um, it's up 13% on 2019 levels, so very, very strong growth. Uh, we're seeing sequential acceleration in its key uh, fashion and leather goods business as well. So there's lots of pockets of strength across the European market. Um, and, and broadly, you know, balance sheets are in very good shape. We're seeing great capital discipline from management teams um, so there's lots of reasons to be constructive going into the end of the year, albeit, you know, I, I wouldn't expect the returns to be as exceptional as we've seen in the last 18 months or so since the depths of the pandemic. All right. Thanks, Dashan. So I think moving from that, you were saying that uh, there's luxury goods and the different sectors that are really attractive. Uh, what, what, are, what are the key drivers do you think that investors right now, it's not really pricing it in yet, they, that they should really be paying attention to within the Europe equity space at this point of time? Uh, so I think there's a few things. I mean, there's, um, there's a, couple of, uh, a couple of themes that I could, that I could mention. I, I, again, I'll caveat that we're not thematic investors. We're very much bottom-up bottom fundamental investors looking for idiosyncratic ideas, but I could group a couple of ideas into a few themes. Um, the first of those would be digitization. And I'm sure this is a topic that's, that's come up um, throughout the evening, but some of these structural trends that we're seeing in things like automation and the internet of things and artificial intelligence, smart factories, smart homes, 
uh, electric vehicles, all of these things are big structural drivers, uh, which are helping um, particularly the semiconductor industry. And Europe has uh, a number of the global leading semiconductor companies within our universe. These are companies with very, very powerful competitive positions, um, you know, R&D leadership. So that's an area of the market that, that we really like. Um, we also see uh, a number of high-tech industrial companies which are tapping into those themes as well. Um, another another uh, theme, if you like, could be the green transition. And again, here, you know, we're seeing companies, we're seeing individuals, we're seeing governments all driving towards net zero ambitions or trying to reduce uh, the carbon intensity uh, of their respected com uh, companies or, 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 uh, or countries. And again, in Europe, we have a number of the global leaders who can benefit from these sorts of trends. So some of our utility companies, for example, are the global leaders in wind energy, global leaders in solar energy. Uh, we have a number of specialty chemical businesses, which are crucial for the renovation of building stock, for example, which is, um, which is a very large carbon emitter. Uh, we have building material companies who are global leaders in things like insulated panels. So again, lots of great opportunities um, in, in that sort of theme. Um, I mentioned luxury as well, um, which, which I won't repeat. Uh, but I think finally, you know, a, a slightly, a, taking a slightly different stance on the question, um, and I think in the panel discussion before, there was a, there was a point on this that, um, you know, there, we have globally, we have kind of aging demographics. Uh, we have people who are going to be retired for longer. People need to fund those retirements. And so, um, you know, income investing or investing in companies which are able to provide attractive dividend yields. Um, but these are, you know, they've got to be well-run businesses, resilient, conservative businesses, well-capitalized businesses. Um, those are also, uh, you know, an attractive part of the market for, for specific portfolios and for, for specific clients who, who require that sort of um, characteristics. All right, thanks, Dashan. I think uh, it's quite interesting when it comes to Europe, like you uh, pointed out that healthcare and the more cyclical oriented ones are usually the, the highlights of uh, Europe, but of course, there's actually a lot of other growth opportunity like your green energy, ESG, your luxury goods uh, component because of that rising, uh, not just your uh, aging population, but also the rising uh, middle age, uh, middle income uh, population around the world that can, of course, fuel that growth uh, demand for luxury goods. So very quickly, we would like to move on to uh, the last theme, which is uh, why is building a globally diversified portfolio important for investing ahead? So back to you, Erica. I think in the eyes of Singapore investors, we clearly have a home ground bias. So we tend to naturally rotate towards uh, Singapore. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the key benefits of having exposure to Singapore equities in your portfolios? Okay. Um, as, you know, if you can see from the past one year, right, the, the recovery has been pretty bumpy and pretty uneven. So it makes sense really to diversify across geographic regions. Um, of course, you know, given the um, attractive valuations as well as the high dividend yield that Singapore market offers, I would recommend investors to, you know, allocate portion of their um, portfolio into Singapore market. Um, that said, uh, I also feel that um, the investors should be open to um, uh, diversifying their portfolio into other markets, for example, uh, U.S. markets. Um, I mean, a lot of uh, investors tell me that, you know, Singapore market doesn't really have a lot of tech mm -hmm. exposure. And then, um, uh, and, and therefore, you know, if you want to have tech exposure, U.S. market really have a breadth of, you know, uh, tech companies that you can really gain exposure to. Um, although I also want to, I also want to say that uh, we are actually making small baby steps into uh, improving the breadth of tech companies in Singapore. You look at the recent IPO of Nanofilm, it has done very well, and uh, it is a good company, good quality company. Uh, and also MSCI has also added uh, C Limited into the MSCI Singapore Index, right? Uh, that uh, could potentially uh, bring in more foreign listings into our MSCI Index. Uh, potential ones would be Grab as well as Razor. So it's um, encouraging to see that trend, uh, but you know, we still need to diversify. All right, yeah. thanks Erica. So the same questions for you, Dashan. I think uh, Erica has kind of spoken in the 
in the eyes of a Singaporean investors uh, with a home bias towards Singapore equities. And of, obviously, having a globally diversified portfolio is really important, especially uh, in times of uncertainty. So for you, Dashan, using uh, uh, at this point of time, I think Singaporeans, we are more comfortable with investing in US as well as in Singapore. But uh, for when it comes to Europe equities, you guys have clearly uh, nailed your core. Uh, Europe has done really well, and your funds, uh, BlackRock funds has, for European funds, have done really well as well. So what do you think uh, are the key uh, advantages that you think uh, investing into Europe uh, is for, uh, for, well, for our normal Singapore investors? Uh, well, I think it's, it's many of the themes um, or many of the things that I've touched on already. And I, I would probably add, uh, I, w I would add and, and agree with, uh, with Erica's points around geographic diversification. I think that is important. Um, it's important not to restrict yourself to, to one geography. Um, and if you're looking in, in a region like Europe, then there are, there are a number of very, very attractive um, businesses operating in kind of niche industries, um, which have very powerful competitive positions, very entrepreneurial um, management teams, very strong cultures, which have been able to drive um, very attractive shareholder returns over many years. The key thing with Europe is uh, it's very important to be selective because if you look at the European index, it's dominated by you know, a number of um, fairly unattractive businesses. So you have to look very, very carefully within the European market to find uh, those, those, those very attractive businesses. All right, thanks, Dashan. So uh, with that, I've come to the end of this panel discussion. Uh, very grateful to Erico and Dashan for uh, gracing us with their presence today uh, and sharing their insightful views with us. I hope everyone turning, tuning in today will have learned more about managing your portfolios more efficiently for the rest of the year and beyond. I know I sure did. So a very big thank you to Erica and Dashan for that. Uh, over back to you, Jaredine.